This is the third episode about scripting in Reactor. And what is scripting? That is you being able to use small snippets of JavaScript to uh, to run whenever you receive a trigger, like pressing a button or turning an encoder or moving a joystick or fader. But most typically, this would be for buttons. So that's the one type of scripting that we are currently exploring. And that helps us to implement really advanced and complex uh, actions. Like if you um, want to have multiple things happening in succession on your ATEM switcher, for instance, and also waiting for the correct feedback. So this is what we looked at in the previous video. Basically, having a script that was uh, fairly long, like this one, and it was going through multiple stages, um, uh, picking up values from the switcher, from constants, from variables, um, using storing those values, um, setting other values, and then executing a transition, and then taking the stored values and restoring them back into the registers in the atom. And all the time we were waiting for the execution of the previous step by getting status information like the whether we were in the middle of a transition or not and waiting for that to complete. So this is a really, really cool example of what scripting can do all inside of Reactor in the UI of the blue pill. So um, this is a super exciting feature, but it is better. It means that there's a ton of things that we would like to improve and expand. One of the things I think we definitely need to expand is better tools around um, debugging your scripts and being able to do that. Because right now you need to kind of know a lot or you have to at least go through some um, fairly um, cumbersome logging inside the uh, system logs here where we, you can kind you can follow along on what the script is doing uh, by uh, writing out to the console but you know I would love that to to be a much more integrated experience so hopefully we'll have that in the future but the scripting feature is here right right now subject to change but quite powerful already in the next episode we'll be looking at script number four which is, an automatic source selection script. So basically, um, we, we could actually see it work right away. We have the ATEM Mini right here. And then uh, I'll just enable my emulation again. If I press this button, then you'll notice that we have a, a um, something happening in the display. It is saying, next up, five, four, three, counting down. There's going to be a change to the input here. Hands off. And you see that change happening. Now we have input number four is on preview. Number one is on program in a moment. So what is this? This is um, current and the next one is going to be four. So it makes this transition and then it's executing a transition right there. Then it is selecting a new source. In this case, it's selected four again, which is surprising to me. Ah, now I know what's going on. Yeah, we have a situation from last time. In the previous video, we were looking at the um, uh, next transition, having uh, a transition a true transition for bringing your upstream keys on. Watch that video if you didn't already. But right now, you, you can see that we have our script running, um, selecting or changing the input source like this between number one and number four. We should see that it's picking a different input. In this case, it's actually randomizing between inputs. So now it's picking input number two and putting that on preview. And then it's executing the transition for this one and then number four and so on. Okay, let's just stop this script. We'll just do that by pressing the button again and look at, uh, look at the uh, configuration of it. So um, let's um, look at, at show more. We have conditional feedback here. Uh, the usual stuff is the color and the script name for the display. Then we have one that if the script is running, the, the color is going to be green of the button. We just saw that actually, so that is true. And we also see that in the title, we have the display label which was uh, a, a variable of the um, apparently of the behavior here. Um, there's this uh, local behavior variable called display label. We just use that to uh, put something up here. So we are apparently manipulating the value of the variable display label inside the script to have that little counter running. Then we have the text lines here, the one called uh, C that's probably current. And this one would be the next one, the upcoming. Um, and that is just reporting from IO references, program input video source, and preview input video source. So essentially what the ATEM switcher has said. So we just have something that is setting an, a preview source, making an, a, a, a transition. After the transition is done, we are selecting another input, and then it's just moving on like that, apparently. Then let's check the final conditional feedback here. It says what um, it will make us a blue color if the yeah when we are in transition. Okay, let's just check that. 
So as we are now waiting for the next change of inputs from two to four, then uh, it's green, but it will become blue whenever we are in transition. I think this is this has nothing to do with scripting. It's just a nice little demonstration that we can use the I/O references and the conditions that's blue to uh, put up a blue color whenever we are in the middle of a transition. Okay, let's move on to the scripting. That's the the thing that we're looking uh, waiting for basically. So we'll, we uh, we take a look at the script here. First of all, we have a, once again a function that can be used to return a, a, a new random source for us. So we have sources one, two, four, five. Now this is probably made for a um, this is probably made for a, um, a an atom switcher that has more than four inputs. And I'm on a, an atom mini today, so I'll, I'll actually modify this to include the source number three, because then we have one, two, and three, and I think that would be nice. And um, maybe. I mean, we could we could maybe have a source like 1000, which I think is like black or color bars or something. I'm a little bit unsure about that, but we could look it up here. So program video input source. Uh, we have something that looks a little bit like it, although I'm currently looking at a constellation anyway. Color bars that would be color bars 2001 and 2002 would be color one and two. So if I wanted a little bit more variety in what we are doing here back in our script, I could do that. Oh, that was a script from a previous episode. Let's say this 2001, 2002. Okay, save current file. So now you can see that it's actually selecting other sources. Then you know, based on that list that we just made, we can check it out over here. I'm also getting a little bit tired of the um, of the long random time that goes in between. But now let's study the script so that we can better understand how this works. We'll just uh, keep that running in the background. And then oh, yeah, the script is over here. So what is it it's doing? It is we have a function that is going to return a random source between the sources that we ask it to. And we're even seeing this being locked in the lock. So maybe if we reload the lock over here, you can see that such a message like selecting new source would actually be shown here. Select new source. The old one was one. What is the new source? Uh, <laughs> it's not even reporting that one, but maybe it's it's shown further down. So um, yeah, we, we see those log messages uh, being output, which is useful for you to know, because this is how you can sort of debug and track progress in your scripts. Uh, and it's using a um, randomized, uh, it's, it's selecting the source randomized, then it is, um, as we have seen in a number of times, it is checking if the event is binary, and if the event is pressed down, reading the value of the ME row variable, integrating that into the uh, program video input source setting where we are getting that value. It says uh, it's basically getting this value um, using that get random function, which is being called right here. You can see that that up in the top here. So um, we use that to get a new source and the new source is then reported right here in the logging. Then we are setting uh, wait, put the new source on preview. Yes. So we take that new source, put it on preview by by setting the IO reference using this function. And then we are also now calculating a um, random value for how long we are going to wait. We are always going to wait five seconds, but then we are basically having a random value, um, you know, within, uh, I think this is probably returning, this is probably returning a value from zero to uh, to one. Uh, multiplying it by 10 and then um, just adding one. And that gives us the number of seconds that we are going to sleep for. And um, then you can see that it is basically looping over this. So what gives us the updated display is that we are uh, 100, um, yeah, 10 times a second by a, we, because we are waiting 100 milliseconds here. We are updating the variable, setting the variable var display label. And that is the that is the label up here in the top. We also saw that in the default feedback where we are using no wait. Uh, are we not? We should. Um, oh, maybe it's down here. Ah, it's, if we are running, then we are setting that makes sense, right? Because if we are not running, we just see script four. script four is the value up here and the text line here. But if we are running, then we are setting the value of display label in that display. Nice. And uh, so we are updating that. Um, and after having updated that, 
We are then triggering the auto transition. Then we are waiting for the transition to complete by reading out the IO reference or the parameter from the ATEM switcher, transition in transition, waiting for that to become false. When that is false, then we are um, basically back to selecting a new source up here, um, writing it into the display, waiting, and then we are just making this transition once again. In this case, actually, if um, yeah, we are waiting 100 times 50 milliseconds, meaning that we will have a maximum five seconds wait for the transition to complete. And if that doesn't happen, we'll just make a cut. That would actually be one thing to, to test, uh, to see if that is true, an interesting thing. Okay, so um, let's try that interesting thing that I claimed was so interesting. So let's just run our little script again here. Um, actually, let's just change it so that we have a little bit of less waiting time. Uh, let's just reduce the randomization of the time there. So save current file, going back here, run the script. So now we are definitely on, uh, on, on slightly shorter time here. All right, so let's just see. We have the transition happening. There's a new selection of a source. Let's just see this happening once again. So we have color eight coming on, coming on, camera number two changing to a source which is random and so on. Now, if I stop the transition, let's try that. So as the transition happens now, I'm just stopping it. We should see that it's actually completing the transition with the cut when five seconds has elapsed. Okay, like that. And so that, that was actually happening. It was waiting for the transition to complete. And if it did not, it would then still kill it like that. All right, so that was the... Uh, third video on scripting and how we can make such advanced automated um, functionality in this case on a single button. Um, during the recording of this video, I did notice a, a case where you can kind of get into trouble. And this is where we need to do more work in Reactor. But that re um, and the, the, the problem was if I make changes to my script as the script is running, and that is saving a new configuration. You can have like a shadow background execution of that script happening, which led me to reboot, not reboot, but restart Reactor. So um, there is definitely some cleanup management that we need to uh, complete before it's safe to use scripting inside of Reactor. But you can already enjoy the features right now, and we um, encourage you to play with it and also give us feedback on how we can improve and what tools would be necessary for this to just be perfect.